really appreciate that, and uh, good morning to uh, our attendees from uh, from North America, and uh, good afternoon from, uh, from those uh, joining us from the UK and, and Europe. Uh, my name is Patrick Dunlap, and I will be uh, delivering today's presentation. Um, I did see there was a, a, an initial note about ECHO, so hopefully that's gone away. Um, if it continues, just let us know, and we'll see what we can do on this end to, uh, to address that. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Patrick Dunlap. I'm the Senior Vice President for North America for uh, TTS. Um, I have um, over 25 years' experience with uh, corporate learning and performance support, um, and uh, am and really excited to show you uh, a little bit about uh, our technology as well as talk a bit about uh, uh, formal learning, informal learning, um, and really how uh, all of those different content types can be addressed with a single product. Um, so let's go ahead and get going. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background information on TTS. Um, we are a global company headquartered in Heidelberg, Germany, uh, 11 offices around the world, uh, just under 300 employees. Uh, been in, in, the, in this uh, industry for almost 20 years, um, and we've got about uh, just shy of 5 million end users uh, of our software globally. Uh, we're very proud of that as well as um, the uh, awards that we've also garnered in this industry, including the MMB Institute, which is a, uh, a German organization that uh, uh, ranks the, the top e-learning and uh, educational products in the marketplace. Um, Amazon as a partner that uh, we uh, have built our cloud stack uh, on top of. And then recently with uh, Brandon Hall, um, which if you're familiar with them, they are really the Oscars in e-learning. Uh, and we've received a gold for uh, the best advance in performance support technology and then a silver in content authoring. So we're quite uh, proud of uh, the industry recognition of, uh, of our technology. So what we'll do is talk a little bit about uh, formal learning and performance support. And I, I know this is a bit of a, a, a busy chart, but I do want to kind of talk about the different strategies that organizations have used in the past and, and really what we are advocating as a, a change in uh, the way that we really focus on helping learners, not only uh, in the initial learning event, but also sustaining long-term performance. Um, if you look at traditional learning curve, which is in the, the blue, um, that represents uh, a, a traditional approach to teaching a group of learners uh, about uh, a topic. Many of these cases, it uh, might be related to software applications, right? So this is something that we see quite often within organizations as they're rolling out large enterprise applications. Uh, there is a formal learning event uh, that happens, and unfortunately, there is that traditional forgetting curve that Ebbinghaus talked about uh, uh, you know, many decades ago. Um, and that forgetting curve uh, actually tends to occur uh, before uh, an actual implementation happens. So, you know, you might, uh, let's say you're, you're implementing a large enterprise application, you might start training six weeks in advance. Um, the challenge is that uh, the majority of that knowledge is gone within three weeks, so you've gone live, um, you know, three weeks after that knowledge is, is degraded, uh, and traditionally you don't have the ability to, uh, to kind of retain that and get that back. Um, with on-the-job learning, which is sort of that green line that uh, kind of curves up on the right-hand side, um, users do recover some of that information. So it, it is, uh, it, it's not uh, uh, something where they, they, they've lost it completely. They do have the ability to uh, use informal methods to capture knowledge within the organization. And that might be something as simple as asking their neighbor. It might be... Uh, something slightly more complex like sticky notes that you might use uh, that you see in, in a typical workspace where people are trying to uh, uh, you know, track and remember key information uh, that they need to. Uh, it might be more formal like a work instruction. What we advocate is, um, and, and I think what the industry is seeing in general, is the whole move toward performance support. So what performance support allows you to do is it doesn't get rid of formal learning. You don't uh, stop using your formal learning content or formal learning approaches, but what you do is you shorten the amount of time in that formal learning um, activity, and you can actually bring that formal learning closer to the actual event, so the, the closer to the go live. There's less degradation of knowledge. Uh, there's less, less leakage, if you will, of, of the knowledge that occurs. Um, you don't forget as much, 
and you supplement that formal learning with performance support. And uh, so part of what we teach in, in the formal learning event is how to get the answers to the questions that you know that you're going to encounter. Uh, and that performance support allows you to uh, really uh, enhance overall knowledge and sustain, sustain that knowledge um, much faster than you would through the classic on-the-job learning. In addition to that, it's more accurate. Um, so instead of asking, you know, John in the cube next to you who might have, you know, forgotten the exact same information but wants to, uh, you know, uh, uh, be the uh, supplier of great information, he may be, you know, that supplier, but he also may be uh, uh, spreading misinformation or the wrong content throughout the organization. So uh, really trying to uh, make sure that we are uh, providing one version of the truth um, and providing the right type of uh, information to the users. So again, formal learning still stays. Um, we shorten the amount of formal learning. We make it more impactful. It's the need to know information. And then we push the nice to know content into performance support and make it available to your users at the time of need. So there's really different goals for each of those learning phases. We find that formal learning is really about the first time we want to introduce a new concept to a learner. Um, and then also when learners are uh, in the uh, mode of wanting to learn more. So they, they finish sort of the on-the-job task and they are available, they have the time, and they want to learn. That wanting to learn more tends to happen in, more in learning nuggets, right? So the micro-learning, the, the smaller, shorter bursts of information that people want to have access to as opposed to uh, stopping what they're doing and going into a four-hour class that, um, you know, that they may have done in the old days. Uh, performance support is really more about application. Um, so it's task-related in many, uh, in most cases. Uh, it is uh, providing uh, support at the time of need uh, and uh, really helping everything from, uh, you know, policy procedure, uh, business process, uh, all of the information that users need to make the appropriate business decisions that we want them to make um, using their tools uh, by giving them all of that information at their fingertips. It's not retraining, it's giving them just enough information to complete the task that they're trying to uh, so that they can continue on and, and perform their work. So our view is that performance uh, support and formal learning really work hand in hand, uh, but it's different layers of content, right? So there's change management at the top, which is you know, the why of, of what I'm doing with the new initiative. And that tends to be very well suited for, for uh, formal learning. Uh, the basic knowledge of how to do something, though, is a combination. It's really a blend of formal and performance support. And then, um, obviously, the how do I, how do I execute, how do I do a particular task, um, that tends to be almost exclusively performance support, much less in the, in the formal learning phases. Um, we believe that there are many learning components that are part of today's learning uh, structure. Uh, everything from you know the change management types of videos or uh, uh, trailers uh, that you're seeing today to really uh, get uh, your uh, workforce engaged, um, all the way through to your self-study materials, the WBTs that you make today, um, the detailed information that uh, uh, users may want to have access to, which might be uh, a work instruction or a data sheet or a best practices document. And then all the way down to the lower, lowest level of step-by-step -step instructions, uh, navigation guidance where you can actually support uh, a user as part of um, an application, a software application, where we're actually showing them how to navigate through that application by uh, providing very detailed performance support. Uh, so all of these different learning components today tend to be created with multiple tools. Uh, when you think about your formal learning aspects, you might have an authoring tool that you're using to create that learning content. So it might be uh, a tool that helps you build uh, e-learning, it helps you build your WBTs, it helps you build simulations. Um, and then you uh, may have other performance support tools that might be application specific. So maybe you purchased an ERP product that uh, has a performance support tool that comes along with that. Um, and you have this uh, sort of mishmash or combination of different tools that you're using to try to deliver all of these different learning components to your user community. What we believe is that uh, our product, the TT Performance uh, Suite, is really one of the only products in the marketplace that allow you to address all of these different uh, uh, learning components 
um, and really bridges the gap between the different development tools that you have in the, in, uh, out there. So you might have uh, some tools on the IT, some tools in the learning development organization, some tools even within technical publications within your product management organization. Um, so we have the ability to create all of these different learning assets and uh, really uh, uh, consolidate into a single product as opposed to the, the challenges and uh, maintenance of, uh, of multiple tools within, uh, within your environment. Uh, in addition to that, and I'm going to show you this in, as we get to the demonstration, is really um, uh, very powerful uh, performance support through uh, integration um, into uh, any application that you might be using. So uh, being able to provide that uh, just-in-time help to really any apps that you're using within your enterprise. Uh, there's an 80% rule. I think that uh, uh, you know everyone talks about 80-20 rule, and, and I think there's an 80% rule that also applies around learning. Um, you know, we just talked about the fact that there's a, a, an amount of learning uh, or knowledge that's forgotten over a period of time, and it's been proven that 80% of the knowledge that you learn uh, with, from especially a formal learning event is lost within weeks. Um, so you know, we we continue to uh, look at you know how do users or how do workers really learn about their job well most of 80 percent of what they need to know about their job is actually learned on the job um, and unfortunately the other challenge is that we're actually spending about 80 percent of our learning budgets focused on formal learning so even though we know that formal learning is going to result in knowledge loss within weeks we know that 80 percent of what workers need to know about their job the learning on the fly, on their job, um, and not necessarily through the most appropriate sources with the right information, but we still are focusing uh, the, the majority of our learning budgets on and activities around formal learning. So we're going to show you a little bit of, of kind of how we can address that. Um, and the TT Performance Suite is really the, the focus of that. Our, our, our first pillar, if you will, for um, uh, our, our product is that learning at the moment of need is a critical component of what uh, we try to offer and make available. Uh, the ability to create blended objects, so not having to recreate content in order to be able to uh, deliver uh, multiple modes of learning uh, to multiple users with multiple learning needs. Um, and then the ability to kind of push and pull uh, information to our learning environment as, as, uh, as, as we choose. Uh, so with that, I will actually uh, jump over and we'll go into uh, demonstration mode and uh, we'll take you through um, a demo of our product. Uh, so what, the way I'll start is uh, through a common enterprise application that I think um, you know, many people use, which is a good old uh, uh, SAP. Uh, so this is an SAP screen that uh, people would tend to use in order to uh, uh, do various transactions within a, a traditional enterprise. Um, so with a you know typical learning approach, we might have gone through you know a, a, a couple of days or potentially even a week of training about this application, um, and within three weeks, I've forgotten eighty percent of that, and I'm back at my desk and I don't know what to do. So I can pull out that wonderful manual, which is probably out of date already, or I can access performance support. And the way that we provide performance support is through this uh, quick access icon, which is actually the system tray. Uh, by simply clicking on that quick access icon, um, what you're able to do is actually, um, it, you can see that it, it recognizes where we are. Uh, it recognizes that I'm inside of the SAP screen. And you can see the, uh, the context, if you will, that's automatically placed within that quick access window. Um, and it uh, is ready to provide field help because it knows I'm in the command field for a transaction code, and it gives me a description of what that field actually does or looks like within uh, this particular application. And then it provides a uh, list of performance support assets that are available to me, so things like a step-by-step -step instruction, a detailed information, uh, and I can actually look at that. Let me just go into, uh, you know, a... Uh, let's call it a BAO1 transaction, uh, and then uh, as we do that, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens with uh, our quick access. So now, this is a sales order screen within uh, SAP. You can see that in the upper right-hand corner now, the because I'm in the order type field, it knows that I'm in that field, and it provides field-level help uh, for that user. In addition, I can also look at something like a step-by-step 
which is a basic guide that uh, can be made available to that user, which shows me how to do a particular transaction. So it knows I go into this particular field, enter VA01, click enter, type FD into that particular area. And I also have a little movie icon so you can show a quick animation of what that would look like to that end user. So each of the steps, the user can just basically hover over that movie icon um, and they can see how that step is actually performed. So it really provides them uh, the guidance that they need uh, alongside of the application. So I don't have to move away from my work environment. I don't have to stop what I'm doing. I can basically open up this window alongside of my live application uh, and have it provide the uh, assistance that I might need. In addition, I could have things like a uh, detailed information, uh, which is something uh, like a work instruction that you might want to use for uh, instructor-led training. So this is a traditional type of document that uh, you can print uh, or have available to you in an online fashion. So again, uh, providing a lot more detail and not just navigation information, but also uh, policy procedure content, uh, things like that. I can also uh, create um, uh, uh, links to uh, existing content. So I could have content in my, uh, uh, in my uh, performance support tool that uh, could be something as simple as a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, uh, that might also be linked where I can provide uh, uh, you know, additional types of content information. I could have an email address um, that, uh, you know, where I can actually send a, uh, an email note so it can actually facilitate uh, communication um, you know, within the organization by putting the appropriate contacts. And that could be a uh, Microsoft link or it could be, you know, an email that uh, automatically opens up. In addition to that, I also have uh, things like a self-learning unit. Uh, so I can show a uh, example of uh, a self-learning unit that's created with this tool. Uh, and a self-learning unit is something that is uh, much more of a traditional type of uh, e-learning uh, content. Uh, so uh, it's, you can see that this is uh, a standard uh, e-learning page. I've got you know, navigation buttons that are, are created here. It tells me my learning duration is about 14 minutes. Um, and then in this particular case, it's actually going to sort of walk me through how to do this particular transaction, including animations and the ability to really interact with um, the, uh, the, the uh, actual uh, e-learning. And this is multiple mode, so I have sort of a presentation mode. I can also do sort of a film mode. So if I don't really want to interact with the learning, I just want to sit back and watch and, uh, and, and watch the movie, if you will, uh, I can do that. And you can see that it um, uh, you know, provides that uh, uh, you know, sort of step-by-step -step instruction for me, um, and it makes that available easily. So, you know, we've created that uh, content, and uh, that content's available as part of this SAP transaction. We can also make that available in other applications. So, for instance, if I go back to my PowerPoint slide, um, one of the things that you'll notice is automatically within quick access, it's, our, uh, it's switched over to PowerPoint, so it knows that I'm in PowerPoint. Um, and with, with Office, uh, because Office doesn't change very often, one of the things that we're actually able to do is provide a, an additional layer of guidance. Uh, so for instance, in this case, I can actually open up um, what we call an overlay mode. Uh, when, with the overlay mode, what it will do is, is provide sort of the step-by-step -step in the live application um, and allow me to uh, uh, you know, navigate through uh, a particular task um, just by uh, simply providing this overlay. So it tells me what to do, how to actually navigate, and at the end it can even provide a rating um, for this particular transaction that I can send and, and uh, update the, an author, for instance, if it's available. Um, so it will follow me uh, regardless of the application I'm using. So for instance, if I go over to, uh, let's say, my success factors uh, screen, you can see that the content sort of follows along. Uh, so I can see all the different learning units that are there. If I go over to um, you know, uh, Salesforce, it'll show me the same type of information. So all of the content is automatically contextualized. We look at where the user is in any of the applications that they might have on their, uh, uh, on their workstation. And as a result, we can deliver the right content at the right time. So the content that we're showing is actually part of a uh, portal. Uh, so this information 
is actually delivered to you as part of a learning portal that we provide as, as part of the TT Performance Suite. So one of the things you'll, you can see is that uh, this portal uh, is another view into that content so that the content that we've created can be delivered as performance support or it can also be delivered to the user as a learning portal or a place that learners can go to find access to the appropriate information about the business. That might be something as straightforward as you know, news that is uh, happening within the organization. It can be a process view, which in this particular case is I can show different business processes within uh, an organization. So maybe it's something like a purchase to pay process. Um, and then I can actually click on sort of the sub processes and all of the details as a result of that. Um, as you'll notice in the upper part of each of these process areas, there are um, uh, job roles associated with that. And one of the things that we can actually do is uh, choose a particular job role that might make sense. So for instance, if I'm the, the head of purchasing, um, I can click on that job role and what it will do is just show me only the uh, purchasing content that's related to uh, my particular job. Now, uh, I'll probably pick the job role that's available in all of these. So uh, you're going to see all of that content. But if I was not the head of purchasing, and let's say I was a different job role, maybe, um, you know, I'll just say back office person, um, the result is that none of that content is available to me now because um, I'm no longer in that particular job role. It's not related to uh, what I do. And we can take this uh, business process information and actually import it in from a variety of different business process tools that are in the market uh, to kind of help you set up the structure for this. Or you can create your own using our product um, so that it gives you a very logical way for users to understand how the content that you're providing relates to other steps of the business process upstream and downstream um, and uh, really provides value around that. We can organize information by topics, so it could be by product, it could be by a, uh, you know, a function within the organization, uh, or by different types of courses. Um, and an example of, uh, you know, we could have applications training, for instance, that we might want to have available. Uh, we may have, uh, you know, different uh, uh, HR or sales training kind of content. Um, and this is, for instance, an example of something that uh, is uh, an e-learning course that's also built with our product. Uh, and this is uh, what's called Michelangelo's Hand, which is uh, it's a company that uh, uh, basically builds um, a uh, 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 prosthetics. Sorry, I was looking for the word uh, for uh, for the marketplace. So uh, it gives you an example of uh, what that would look like. So again, this has been built with the TT Performance Suite. So it looks more like a kind of traditional e-learning, and you can have different videos, uh, different components inside of that that uh, you know allow you to focus on you know, what the different parts of a, uh, uh, this artificial hand would look like. Um, and um, again, so uh, with the ability to add in assessments or different questions along those lines. So uh, this can also be launched from a learning management system, uh, but it can also be made available through uh, the uh, TT Performance Suite as an alternative way to, uh, to deliver this type of content. Um, so it really gives you a lot of flexibility around uh, structuring this information and making it available to the user, uh, but again, uh, giving you the ability to uh, focus uh, the content by uh, job role or by language or any of the uh, other uh, ways that you might want to filter that information. Okay, so that is uh, just a little bit about um, the uh, content that uh, uh, that we can create, if you will, from an end user perspective. Um, now what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know, how we create some of this. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to the United States Postal Service site and I'm going to op open up our quick access again. Um, and it will basically say, hey, I'm at the USPS site and there's no content related for this particular uh, uh, website. So what we're going to do is create some content uh, and we're going to show you how we'll make that available to our users uh, sort of at the point of need. Um, so now I've taken off my end user hat. I'm no longer navigating through my quick access or, or through my portal to find content. I'm now an author creating content. Um, so I'm logging into our, uh, our authoring platform. You can see the first thing that we encounter are the different uh, roles uh, that we make available to, um, to our customers. 
And these are just out of the box rules. These are not uh, customized in any way, but uh, you have almost unlimited ability to customize and create different rules with different permissions depending upon your organization and the amount of uh, access or capability that you want to provide to um, a, a particular author, editor, subject matter experts, whatever it might be. Um, so I've got a rule called all rules, if you will, uh, and then I'll just basically um, log in. And there is always the Murphy's Law on doing demos, and I think I just uh, hit it. So uh, just give me one second, because normally I think I may have just had this open too long. And I'm going to go ahead and launch that again so that we can uh, get that started. Um, so what I'll do is just log in. Uh, because it's a cloud-based product, we uh, give you the ability to uh, create all of the content in the cloud. Uh, an author only needs a uh, small executable, relatively small executable, in order to create new content. Um, and uh, we'll show you how we actually sort of log into that system and, uh, and make that happen. So I'm logging into our uh, cloud environment. In this particular case, it's our demo environment that uh, I have in uh, Germany. Uh, and then I will um, give it my password. And this time I shouldn't time out. So I'll go ahead and uh, click on the all roles, and then I'm logging into the system. So now what it shows me is this is my uh, sort of work pool, if you will. So it shows me documents that I'm responsible for, or documents that uh, I've created. But you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, there are some of the same uh, process areas, if you remember that from the uh, portal, where we had all of the process content. So this is how you would sort of organize and manage that. Same thing with our topics and our courses. Um, it makes it uh, really easy to uh, create content, manage content, or uh, uh, you know, review or, uh, uh, or publish that content out. So what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and create a new document, and this will be a process document. And you can have different uh, types of documents, and again, these are uh, you know, just sort of placeholder terms that we use, but uh, most of our customers will uh, create uh, uh, you know, their own variation of these. And I will um, you know, create a... Uh, So uh, I'll say just moving house, all right? So what's going to happen at this point? And, and when I'm finished with this, I'll just release this directly out so it's published. I can choose my content language uh, up to about uh, almost 40 different languages that we support. Um, and then I could have also very easily assigned this document to an uh, individual within my system. So uh, it might be another author that I want to, uh, to work with. Uh, and and uh, uh, my, my job might be an administrator to make that happen. So it's going to create a document. Uh, I could also create a, a placeholder or upload a file uh, if that was the, uh, the chosen way to do that. Um, and then I'll basically click on the, uh, uh, and just choose a different mode here. And I'm going to make my uh, screen resolution just a little bit bigger. I'll make it, uh, let's make it 1440 by 900. And then I'll just go ahead and say finish. Um, so what it basically does at this point is opens up our, um, our uh, editor, uh, and you'll see that uh, the first thing that will happen is I've got kind of different views across the top. I'll switch over to my e-learning view, and I've got on my right-hand side some animations I'll turn off right now. So this is uh, my course, if you will. So we provide a standard template. You know, you can use our template. Uh, most of our customers, if not all of them, create their own templates, their own look and feel of what their courses is going to look like. Uh, so that will be different images, different number of pages. It might have um, you know, obviously their branding and logos, all of those different components. Um, and in our standard out of the box, I've really only got four pages in my course. Uh, my second page is kind of my learning duration, and obviously I can go in here and just type in, you know, any text uh, 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 that I, I might want to to, uh, to make that available. I've got uh, sort of a, a standard page, and this looks like uh, something you might be familiar with. It looks like PowerPoint, right? So. Uh, the idea is that it should be extremely easy to use, uh, just like a PowerPoint might be. Um, so I can create things like, you know, maybe uh, a, a, a basic text box, you know, with a hint. I might be able to, you know, want to create something like a, an arrow uh, to the left, right, and, and move that over and basically say, yeah, I want this arrow to, to point to this particular area. Um, and maybe I want something like a, uh, an effect to happen with that. So I might choose an animation, so I want to, you know, fly in. Um, you know, straight from the right-hand side. 
um, and you can look at the type of animations that you would typically see with a PowerPoint. Um, and at any point, I can sort of test that and preview it. So I'll just hit F5, and you can see that you know it uh, basically. I'll do that again just so you can see it. But you, um, you know, you can see very quickly what that would look like. So giving you a lot of the same kind of tools and uh, layout uh, controls that you have with uh, traditional authoring tools. And you have the ability to add test questions. Um, you can assign, you know, single choice, multiple choice elements, whatever it might be. Um, but the idea being that um, it's a very flexible, very easy to use um, tool set that um, uh, allows you to uh, uh, to uh, create content very rapidly without uh, having you know lots of knowledge in these uh, in, in these tools. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll actually show you how we kind of create some of the um, uh, uh, the, the more complex uh, content like a guide. Uh, so I'll actually go in and start a recording um, and it will ask me, okay, so what do you want to record? Um, and I'll actually say, okay, let's go to the United States Postal Service um, website and you'll notice that it automatically opens that up uh, and it sizes it at the right level. So, uh, so I don't have to really do anything. It allows the authors to uh, really just kind of focus on what they want to do and, and if you've got a subject matter expert training that they find it extremely easy to use. The recorder window is on the right hand side and it's an event based recorder so it only records when there's an action. Um, so if I go away and have a cup of coffee right now and come back it's not going to record anything. Uh, so it, it allows me to let's say click on you know track and manage uh, you know within uh, the, the US Postal Service website. It'll capture that uh, you know uh, automatically so you can see that click the track and manage hyperlink uh, maybe I want to do a you know forward mail instead of a or a change of address or any of those uh, different components. Um, so again, as I am clicking on that, it captures that information automatically, um, and then um, I'll click on you know something like change your address, and it'll capture that as well. Um, so basically, by simply doing the transaction in sort of the live application, uh, it gives me the opportunity to capture all of those details. Um, and uh, I can pause at any time. I can, you know, uh, for instance, if I don't want the user to scroll down to the bottom because I know there's a scroll that's going to occur, and I don't want them to have to do that as part of my, um, you know, playback during uh, the actual course. I can pause it. I can undo. I can redo. I can do all those different things. Um, and then I can say, you know, something like maybe this is a temporary move, and I can choose, you know, a start date. So really, any of the actions that happen within your Windows or, um, or, or web-based application, so we're not limited to a particular uh, type of application. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and sit and stop at this point so we don't actually go through the whole process of uh, doing a, uh, a change in, uh, in the, uh, the Postal Service application. So now I'll go back. Um, I've recorded, uh, if you remember, this is my standard sort of template information that we've created. Um, and then below that is uh, the information that I recorded and inserted. I'll move this over so you can see the whole page. Um, you can see that we've captured all of those steps uh, as well as highlighted inside of there any of the actions that occurred uh, inside of that. And this is just one of the views. So uh, even though I've recorded it as an e-learning, I also have the, that available to me in a documentation format. Um, so if I scroll down, you can see that I've created documentation automatically as part of uh, uh, this recording process, and I've also created in a guide. Uh, so I can do editing of uh, these different pages. I can do uh, changes in one also appear and reflect in other modes if you choose to allow that to occur. Um, and then when I'm ready, um, I can basically publish this content and make it available to, um, uh, to my users, right? Uh, so I'll go ahead and say, Yes, I want to save this. I'm going to upload this back into uh, my knowledge repository. Um, and while it's doing that, um, one of the things that occurs is we could have sent this. I, I've set this up to automatically publish, but normally what I would do is I would have this set up into a workflow. So with that workflow, I might have a very complex workflow with multiple steps. I might have a very simple workflow of just one or two reviewers. Uh, but basically, the idea is you design your workflow that would allow you to send this document to a particular person or group um, to review, edit, modify, whatever it might be. Uh, and then at the end of that workflow, you would actually release it out to a user population. 
because it's uh, a content management system, we are also uh, doing automated um, versioning. So every time you make a change to the document, we create a new version of that document. So in this particular case, you're going to see um, that uh, we've got current version is 1.1, um, and it's automatically been uploaded. We've got the name of the document. We've got the, the workflow, which I'm using, which is basically say release or publish. Um, and uh, at any time, if I created a new version of it, it'll show version 1.2, 1.3. I can actually say, okay, show me 1.4 and 1.1, and show me the differences between those two documents. Um, and it, it can actually show you those differences. So, and you can do rollbacks to previous versions as you might need to. So for a group of authors who are creating documentation, it really provides uh, the ability to manage that content development process in a way that you may not have today using some of the tools that are uh, that are out there or it might be a little bit more difficult to do so. Um, so we've created our content, we've made it available. Let's just sort of take a look at from an end user perspective again, um, you know, what this really kind of looks like. So I'll go back to my, uh, you know, my home page of my U.S. Postal Service uh, and then I'll go to my quick access and say, okay, now what? Um, so with quick access, um, now you'll see that with my U.S. Postal Service, I now have three different um, content types that are available to me based off of the context. And you notice that I didn't have to create that contextual link. That contextual link was made automatically as part of the recording. I can manually do that, though, if I choose to. So if I have an existing document, maybe it's a Word document, a PDF, or content that sits out on my, um, in my existing intranet, like maybe it's in SharePoint and no one and my users can't find the content. They spend days and hours. We know it's there. We know it's great, but I can't get to it. Um, we can contextualize the existing content as well and make that available within this quick access so it's not just content that we create. But let me just take a quick look at uh, what was created. This is an example of a guide. So again, uh, we sort of created that step-by-step -step guide that the user can look at and say, all right, this is how I do it. And again, by just hovering over the animation, you can see sort of the uh, the detail of uh, how what that step looks like, sort of the kind of mini-movie. Um, and um, that was all, again, done uh, by simply uh, creating the content and publishing it out. I also created a uh, detailed information, sort of a documentation view um, of this particular um, uh, transaction. So you can see that uh, that was built uh, with uh, the different call-outs where I've got multiple steps within uh, the area and all of the uh, actions were uh, automatically captured uh, and labeled. So as an author, I have minimal effort to go back in and uh, make this content ready. Obviously, I want to add business process and policy procedure content, but I don't have to spend a huge amount of time editing text or writing in information. And for those of you who uh, might be using the very um, uh, uh, you know, uh, very commonly used Snagit Microsoft Word, um, you know, you, you'll find that this is extremely faster and allows you to update and create content uh, almost instantly in comparison to, uh, to tools like that. Uh, and then there's also uh, a learning unit that we created. So again, one recording, but multiple uh, outputs um, uh, automatically created including my e-learning course, and, and obviously it helps having the template, sort of the structure, um, you know, whatever learning targets or information I might want to put in here. And then again, you know, my little, you know, text box that I put in my uh, animation that I kind of created. Not the prettiest thing, but just uh, I, I think you guys get the hint. Um, and in this particular case, it wants me to click on the track and manage hyperlink. Okay, so it wants me to demonstrate that I know what to do, so I'm actually going to click on it. Now it's going to say, all right, now click on the forward mail hyperlink. And I can do that as well. All right, I'm going to click on forward mail. Um, and at any time, I can say, you know what, I'm in this interactive mode. I don't really want to be in the interactive mode anymore. I want to switch over to my film mode. I just want to watch the rest of that e-learning uh, happen. And now my hands are off the keyboard, if you will, and it's automatically advancing through and showing and demonstrating how this particular task might be done. So if we go back to um, you know, what we talked about earlier, uh, with the ability to, um, you know, within our uh, uh, learning environment. Let me just kind of open this back up again so that we can see. Um, but the idea is, uh, you know, from a single, uh, you know, recording, really being able to create multiple outputs uh, and, uh, and really uh, addressing that informal learning need. So the content can be uh, created, that e-learning content that I just demonstrated, for instance, could be 
uh, package as a SWARM or AICC uh, package and upload it into a learning management system as formal content. Uh, and it also can be delivered informally through the TT Performance Suite um, using quick access or using our portal um, for users to be able to you know, very quickly find the information that they're looking for uh, and, um, uh, and, and make that available. There is a question about text-to-speech. Absolutely, we do have text-to-speech, and so we support out-of-the-box um, uh, not only the traditional kind of Microsoft, which, um, you know, there's uh, uh, questions around quality of, of, of the voices, if you will, but we also support uh, uh, very high-quality text-to-speech providers like ReadSpeaker. Um, there are other capabilities that we have, um, uh, not only for text-to-speech, but uh, for translation. Uh, so we support excellent editors, and then also the ability to do what's called a re-record. Um, and with a re-record, uh, what it basically does is it allows you to, for instance, create content in one language. Let's say you have English screens. And then you wanted to recreate that maybe in Spanish. Um, and basically uh, opening up uh, uh, the same software, if you will, in, with a Spanish interface. And instead of the author having to manually go through and recreate that content with all of the uh, you know, Spanish screens and Spanish text, uh, our software can automate, automatically replicate that same content using that new language screen, um, and that's partly because of our very deep object recognition where we can actually understand where things are on the screen, and even if in the English screen uh, the address field's in the upper left-hand corner, but in the Spanish screen it's in the bottom right-hand corner, we'll recognize what that field is and we'll actually capture it in the right location because of that object recognition. Uh, so it provides a very, very um, powerful way to not only create content, deliver content in multiple modes, uh, but also um, uh, to localize and translate that content to, to support all of your different learners' needs. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do, ultimately, at the end of the day, support all different types of learners. There are some learners who are, who are very good at, uh, you know, uh, uh, web-based learning. There are some learners who don't want a lot of formal learning. They want to kind of search on their own, especially the millennials, the digital natives who have grown up uh, with Google and searching for content. And there are learners who uh, still, you know, today prefer the traditional instructor-led training. So um, we have the ability to kind of support all of those different learning modes and learning needs um, within the single uh, software product. So that is uh, the end of the demonstration. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is open up for any questions uh, from the audience. Um, and uh, please, if you don't mind, there's a question tab at the, uh, within the, the uh, GoToWebinar. Um, if you could just type in any questions that you might have, and then I'm happy to, uh, to uh, respond to those.